If I ever go anywhere further, you can see I don't need anyone to introduce me. I'm just going to get my mama to stand in front of me, and surely everyone will be ready to vote. I, I, I want to start off by saying thank you for allowing me to be with you, Olga. Thank you uh, for having me and setting this up and allowing me to come speak and just talk about what's important to our community, but also why electing Kamala Harris as the next president of the United States of America is so important to every single one of us, not only in the city of Brunswick, but all throughout Georgia. I, I say that because it's, it's really hard when you come from the community I've come from. We've been in line with so many people who had to break barriers. And I understand what it is to break a barrier. I think a few years back before I got here, us as a city broke a barrier and we voted the first African-American mayor in in the city of Brunswick and that was Cornell Harvey. A little bit before that, I, I am sure everyone showed up and knocked doors and showed out. And a little bit before that, we had elected the first African-American president in the United States then Senator Barack Obama, but to be President Barack Obama. And that happened solely because of the work in this place called Brunswick, but that just didn't stop there. I, I seen people live out the legacy of many women who came before, which is why we have a sitting school board member who's willing to stand up and stand out and say what she means and stand before the people the way she means to stand before the people and stand up for the people in a real way, and that's Miss Audrey Gibbons. It's easy because I sat under my dad at many tables when they had conversations about taking down a flag that had flew over our state for decades upon decades upon decades. And while it was fine because it was adorned with the state seal, next to that state seal, there was an emblem of hate for so many because they plastered the Confederate flag right next to it. And my dad sat at those tables, those tables who said that that emblem would never be removed from the state flag and through work and through toil and through taking our little church bank van and putting people on that church van and driving them down to Jacksonville, Florida to do their school shopping and to do their grocery shopping. We not only learned that we had to speak with our feet, but that we could speak with our dollars. And we learned that for the first time. And, and the next thing that we would learn down the road is a couple teachers would get together in the middle of our community because for kids who are look like me and for kids who went to school beside my church right there on 1416 Amherst Street for kids who grew up on the south side that didn't have an option for summer school at all. There was no city summer school, county summer programs were a little too far to get to. There was a little band of teachers who made a decision to do something for the first time that this city had ever seen it. And they got together and started a, a summer enrichment program. And that young lady happened to be my mama, Dr. Regina. H. Johnson. I say all of that because it's important to highlight the first. In this election, we have a historical moment. And that moment before us is just as important as all of the other moments that I spoke about just now. We have the, the chance to be the first generation to vote for a president that will be far different than any other president that we've ever had in our nation. We have a chance for the first time to vote for a convicted felon. We have a chance to vote for the first time for somebody who has openly disrespected women and has not been shy about it. We have a chance for the first time to elect somebody who said that they would use the US military against our own citizens. You have a chance for the first time to vote for a man who said that he would rip up the Constitution on day one. You have a 
chance to vote for a man that for the first time in our country's history said that he wouldn't pay attention to the Constitution and he only wanted to be a dictator for one day. I understand the other first that we are talking about in this election, but I would dare to say that there is a way more important first that we should be worried about. Hitler doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen because somebody so great figures out to speak a certain way. It happens because over time, good people who are well-meaning decide to care about things that are less important. And right now, the things that we should be focused on while the other side of those first are so great, and we'll get to them. The thing that I want everybody to leave here understanding is for the first time in this nation's great history, you have a chance to either vote for that or vote for a future where all of us have the rights that are bestowed upon us in that great constitution. We have the chance to link arms and stand up against something that is so apparent and so dangerous that we have never seen it at least in my 39 soon-to-be years. I say that because against that, we are juxtaposed against the first that we probably talk about a little bit more. We have the chance to vote for our first African-American, Asian-American woman in this nation's history to ascend to this point. We have a chance to vote for a a sister who had to call her mama for a couple extra dollars when she was at Howard. We got a chance to vote for a, a, a woman who understands what it means to sweat your edges out. We, we, we got a chance to vote for a woman who understands what it means to stroll with your sorrows. You, you got a chance to vote for a woman who didn't just talk about immigration, she didn't just talk about the perils of those things that stand before us. She actually worked in California to ensure that she protected her state against every single person who would damage the fabric of this great nation while also ensuring that we are a home that everyone would be welcome in. You got the first chance to do that. You had the first chance to, to vote for a woman who decided instead of going to make millions of dollars in some law practice and to bury her head in the sand, chose to stick her neck out, not only for those in California, but for all of those across this great nation, ensuring that we upheld the things that we worked so hard to fight for. Ensuring that health care for every single person in this nation is available because let's not forget they were trying to tear that down. We had a woman who stood up, who stood up in the midst of everything that could possibly be going wrong on the national stage and chose to say out of her mouth that people who look like her and people who have been subjugated by this country deserve the same shot as everybody else. And as much as we can, as soon as they started demonizing DEI and other efforts to include those in the spaces that they had not been included upon, she didn't get scared like a lot of corporations and start getting rid of their DEI efforts. They didn't start burying those in the back of some HR system so nobody had to touch it. She stood out in front because she knew a country that had worked so hard to hold so many back that maybe for the first time, we should give that great credence of this America a chance out of many one. And maybe when we actually work to be that country, better things will happen, better outcomes will happen, generational poverty will be ended. And those are the type of things that you have a chance to vote for for the first time. I'm reminded of an uh, old bishop a woman who, if you remember back in the day, women couldn't preach. They wouldn't even let women in the pulpit. Women had to kind of speak on the 
side of the pulpit because they weren't allowed to preach. And this is one of the, the first preachers that uh, broke through that mold. And I say this because all of those years in Cleveland, Ohio, I was with my aunt, who's a dynamic preacher in, in, in Cleveland, and she's absolutely amazing. But the, the thing that, that that elder bishop said when asked, they said, what did it take to get to where you got? What did it take? to stand in front of so much hate? What did it take to get to this place? And I'm sure if we asked Vice President Kamala Harris this question, she may have something that is very much the same. And she said these two words, and I thought they were so dynamic, I had to tell them to you tonight. When asked what it took, she said, simply everything. That's what this moment demands. It's not a moment for us to have discussions about policy. I'm fine if you want to have a policy discussion, but that's not where we are. I'm OK if you want to talk about what real immigration policy looks like, but that's not where we are. I'm OK if you want to talk about the proper, proper role of the Federal Reserve, if you want to talk about tax and tariff policy with China, and if you want to talk about aggression in AI, I'm fine if we want to have conversations about that, but I must remind everyone who has chosen to be in this room this evening because you care, that ain't what we talking about. We are talking about an apparent evil of our generation. And that evil needs to be met with the same type of resistance that they are meeting us with. I say all of that to say is, I never really got a chance to be a first much. I wasn't the first born. I got an <laughs> older brother. I surely wasn't first in school. I, I tell this joke honestly because my girlfriend is so much smarter than me. You know, when I graduated, she took her graduation pictures and she had on stoles and ropes and <laughs> chains and medallions, you know what I mean? And then when I graduated, I said, I looked like I was in the choir. <laughs> I just had a, my robe was just blank. I barely got the hat. But I, I, I learned something. I learned something in that moment because there was one rule that my mama had. She said, you couldn't do nothing else unless you kept hope. That was it. She said, boy, you ain't good enough in no sport to go nowhere. <laughs> and, and, and you're just smart enough to get out of here. So you're going to keep hope because we need to keep hope alive. We ain't paying for it, OK? And so <laughs> when, when that declaration was made, I, I will tell you, there were a lot of times that I had to debate with some teachers. And that's probably why I'm a lobbyist in my day job now. I, I sit down with the math teacher. Let's work this out now. I see it's a 79, but I need an 80. I need to stay in that 80 range. What can I do? And, and what, what I came to learn is that that one point I needed kept me in the number. And I, I don't know if many of you have went to an old Baptist black church, but, but in, that, in that Baptist black church, they do talk about being in the number. In the number. I, I, I wasn't first. I, I surely wasn't second. I wasn't third, fourth, or fifth. But I, I was in the, in the number. And being in the number mattered so much. And it mattered so much because I started thinking about the salvation that we do talk about in that, that little Baptist church in 1416 Amherst Street. And what I started to think about is that the first person who got to tell that message, the, the first person who got to spread that message of a risen Savior, the first person who got to talk about what Jesus had done in an earth, the first person who got to reach out beyond themselves and tell themselves about a Christ that had risen and wanted to tell a good story, the first person who got the chance to tell that story was a woman named Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene could have kept that to herself. She could have balled that, that information up and said, only I know that the Savior is alive and only I know that the Savior has come. But she decided to do something that many people don't do today. She decided to share. And she shared that information because while she was the first, she knew the first wasn't that important. She knew it was more important to be. I, I tend to think if we were to ask 
Vice President Harris, what was more important to her in this moment? Would it be that you were the first African-American and Asian-American woman to ascend to this level? Were you the first African-American and Asian-American woman to, to, to be able to have the Democratic nomination? You were the first African-American and Asian-American woman to knock doors and say, I could be the next president of the United States. And if you asked her, I wonder, would being first be the most important thing that she would have or with the thing she would do, the thing that she would say, the way that she would be was much like Mary Magdalene. It's more important that I get as many people in the number. It's more important that I get as many people health care as possible. It's more important that I get as many people into their dreams as possible. It's more important that I provide assistance so people can have a piece of that American dream and own a home and go to college and raise their children. It's more important that they be in that number. It's more important that I care about the women after they decide to have the child. that I can have, stop having a conversation just about abortion and say, let's have a conversation about healthcare and education from cradle to career. Hey, 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 hey. Let's stop telling parents they have to find a way to exorbitantly raise their children from zero to six because that's when we decide education should kick in. I'm sure if we had that discussion with our now vice president, soon to be president, she would say being first is cute, but it's far more important to ensure that they are in the number and in the number, in the number matters so much. I think it, I don't know what church you go to, but she, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna start going. You are as a armor bearer right there. I, I would say that because when you start thinking about those times where just being in the number was the most important thing, you start thinking about some of the most magnanimous times in history. You see, in civil rights, there was a lot of people who stayed home, but other people like my parents and other people like the people of this community, other people said, I might not be Martin Luther King Jr. I, I might not be Malcolm X. I might not be Mega Evers. I might not be Rosa Parks, but I can be in the number. I might not be every leader. I might not be the person who's on the front of the program. My name might not even be in the history books, but we don't get in the history books without everybody being willing to be in the number. We don't change anything unless we're willing to be in the number. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we can have a debate about policy. I'm willing to have that debate, but we are, what we are not willing to do is to sit idly by while they put forward things like Project 2025, which dismantles every single federal worker that works for you and I, ensuring that we have clean rivers and clean oceans and a marsh and our kids can fish and our kids can hunt. The very things that we care about, clean air and clean water, they want to dismantle all of those things and I, I say that because it's important because it matters that you're in the number. I think about women's equality when they decided to get a vote and they linked arms and marched up and down New York City and they marched up and down Philadelphia and they marched up and down Atlanta and they did all of this at a time where a woman couldn't even get a credit card without her husband signing on. Where a husband could just decide to call his wife crazy. And the hospitals would send a van out and pick her up. At a time where those kinds of things can happen, you have women so strong that they said, if I get my hands on that voting machine, one day, one day, one day after they've appeased us with letting us get our own credit card, Amazon made sure that happened. <laughs> when, they, when they gave us all of the things that they thought would appease us, 
One day, we could have sent somebody who looked like us and who looked like our daughters and who looked like our sisters and who looked like our friends and who looked like our sorors. And when we looked in those little girls' eyes and when we told them they could be whatever it is they wanted to be, one day we'll send somebody up there so when we say it, that will be true. Somebody will prove that that can be true. It matters to be in the number because there are so many other numbers that are important. And those numbers are also apparent. I think about the number of Igbo slaves that came to the shores of this great area. And while not all of them walked into the water, a number of them decided to look at others who were being dragged off of ships and said, instead of having my freedom be stripped away, I'd rather walk into freedom. And if that means challenging the ocean, let me challenge the ocean. You see, some people say they killed themselves. I don't believe that they killed themselves. I say that they chose to challenge the ocean rather than have their freedom snatched away. And that story has remained so long that we have a history marker on St. Simon's to note, to denote where that happened at. And so I say that because some people write down that freedom ain't free. Some people write down those things. But some people, there are very few. That's why I, I like rooms like this. There are very few who actually believe those things that were etched that said, give me liberty or give me death. And the highest example of that came in to this shore, as you see, being in the number mattered because there were some Jewish people who decided not to leave Germany. They didn't have the means to get on planes and trains and automobiles. They didn't have family in other areas. So they had to stay right there, right in the middle of it. And when they were dragged out of their homes and dragged out of their businesses, I don't know, some of them are, are still alive. And if you ever meet any of them, if you ever talk to any of them that lived through that dark and insidious time, at some point in time in that conversation, they'll lift up. They'll lift up. They'll lift up their sleeve. And I'll show you a number. It matters to be in the number. Being in the number ain't easy. Being in the number ain't nothing we always clap about. It ain't always this safe to be in the number. It ain't always this okay to be in the number. But I can promise you what we are dealing with today. It's not an election. It is a moment that we have to look out amongst the fabric of time and say that that great arc of justice does bend, but we sure got to make it bend. I want us to know that this is a moment where all of us are probably have some amount of anxiousness in our spirit. I don't know about you, but my, uh, my, my YouTube search is looking up a lot of historical Nazi stuff just to see how it happened, just to make sure we're not on the way, you know? And so, I say that because I understand that we could have some fear and some worry about what if. We could have some fear and some worry about those in our community and what they will do to us and, and what they say and what they write on Facebook. And I will tell you a quick story about uh, Angel of Brunswick, who was the first person who made me speak. The first person who really made me speak was Regina Johnson because she made me do Easter speeches. But after that was a woman named C.A. Lee. C.A. Lee, civil rights icon, uh, 
meant the world to this area. Absolutely brilliant woman. And she would do the Martin Luther King Day uh, ceremonies every year. One year, I don't know what made her ask, but she asked my mom if I could speak. And as I said, I, you remember I told you I was never first. There was a young man named Curtis Ballard. Now, Curtis was a prodigy preacher, y'all. Curtis was a prodigy preacher. This young man, eight, nine years old, could just recite. and re I think he's a preacher now. He, he was cold, y'all. I didn't want to go after him. And so because they knew I was number two, I had to go before him. Thank God. Um, and the first time I went up, I remember C.A. Lee, one of her rules was you couldn't have the speech with you. You had to memorize that thing. Oh, Jesus, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for that. I said, you know, I begged mama. I said, I can't memorize it. I'm going to forget it. Mama said, I ain't got no control over C.A. Lee, so you're going to have to take that up with her. I talked to C.A. Lee, and C.A. Lee said, nah, you got to memorize this thing. And we would do the practices every day in different school rooms around Brunswick getting ready. Uh, I asked her one day, I said, well, what am I supposed to do if I get scared? If I, if I forget the words, what am I supposed to do? And she said, well, if you get scared, do it anyway. I didn't understand how real that advice was. Because C.A. Lee's advice has transcended to right now. If you get scared, do it anyway. If they cuss at you and they yell at you, and they will, do it anyway. There's people who you're uncomfortable having that conversation with because they got the Trump stickers on their car. Uh, a cross on the back of their truck right next to a F Joe Biden sign. And I don't know how that goes together, but when Trump can sell you a Bible, I guess we, we into different kinds of times. And so I'll tell you, you can be scared, but do it anyway. You can be worried, but do it anyway. You can be tired, but do it anyway. You can get sick of calling these people over and over again, but do it anyway. And we do it because of a story that C.A. Lee and so many others of us taught us in that Sunday school where I had Miss Summers as a teacher. And there was a story that she would teach us about three men who had a friend and their friend was hurt and they needed to get their friend to Jesus. Mm. There's too many people in front of the door, although they tried and they tried to push through the front of the door. There was too many people there. So they took their friend out and they walked around the side of the church. I'm sure it wasn't a church. It wasn't Miss Summers. It was, you know, a, a, some, a temple, you know. And they, they walk around and they try and get to the, to the window of the, of the synagogue. And when they see the window of the synagogue, the window was locked. They couldn't get him in there. Maybe he didn't fit in the window and they, they said, man, what are we gonna do? We, we got it. And, and at that point I said, man, most people would say, you're out of luck, brother. We tried, we're gonna leave you right here. I think Jesus walk out this way. But instead of doing that, those friends put them on a bed and made a pulley. I don't know what kind of ingenuity they had and they pulled them up to the roof and they cut a hole in the roof and they lowered them down right in front of Jesus, right in front of some hope right in front of some love. The reason they say do it anyway is because of the lesson of those three men. You might go to the front door, it might not work. You might go to the window, it might be locked. But don't turn away because the help that we gotta provide our people, the amount of people out there that need to be lowered into the roof so they can just get a little hug. Just get a little grace. Just get a little mercy. Just get a little help. Just get a little care. Just get a little bit of forgiveness. The work that it takes to do that is the work that is set before us today. I say all of those things to say, we got how many more days? 
I knew we know. We got eight, seven. Somebody might knock some doors tonight, so I'm going to say eight. We can make some phone calls. With seven days and one night before us, you might be tired. You might be sick of it. But this one matters too much. So do it anyway. God bless you guys. All right.